A Legend Reborn, chronicling the restoration and spotlighting the men who built the first Shelby Mustang GT350 race car. On this edition of A Legend Reborn, the crew visits sunny Southern California to interview motorsports legend Larry Ofria. Hi, this is Larry Ofria. For, uh... During our research into the construction of 5R002, we ran across a number of names of individuals who and machine shops who had done work for Carroll Shelby during the 60s. One of these individuals was a, a man named Larry Ofria who had built the heads for Carroll Shelby's race cars all through the 60s. Larry Ofria owns Valley Head Service, which is still in business today, and he's still building heads. And one of our goals for this project was to try to make it as authentic as possible. So we contacted Larry. He still had all of the individual cards for the heads that he had built back in the 60s. And we used his services to build the heads for 5R002, just as they did back then. At first glance, Valley Head Service in Northridge, California resembles any other professional garage around the country. But after spending the afternoon with owner Larry Ofria, we learned that there is nothing ordinary about this place or this man. Larry says he's always been interested in automobiles. His fascination began with a pair of Willys, a Willys Coupe and a Willys Pickup, both 1941 models. It was frustration over his lack of knowledge and equipment at the time that drove his desire to learn more about building automobiles and later race cars. And I never had the knowledge nor the equipment to do either one. And I said at that time, I said, by the time I die, I want to be able to do everything. In his lifetime, Larry has learned how to do just about everything, at least when it comes to race cars. His resume is now filled with work for some of racing's greatest names. But what we learned was that his journey to success was very different than most of his counterparts of the era. When I first started out, I, I was in a chicken coop, which used to be my father's workshop. My father was a tailor uh, who made a lot of Western clothes for the Western movie stars. And so I grew up with all the movie stars like Roy Rogers. Well, I went to school with Cheryl Rogers, uh, Roy's daughter, and uh, Monty Montana, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, we got to see, I got to know a lot of the old western movie stars. Although Larry's self-taught education began in that chicken coop, it was his first job as a metrologist that helped him hone the skills he would later need to build the heads for Shelby Racing. Where I learned my profession was, uh, I worked for a company called Linton Industries. And uh, I worked in their quality assurance uh, department as a... Uh, uh, metrologist, which is the study of precision weights and measurements. In that uh, department, that's where I learned a little bit about vacuum and pressure because that was part of our job. So then Linton came along in the, in the uh, 60s, in 1962, and decided to close up the whole department. Just 135 of us were out of the job. In 1964, Laro Freya made his first attempt to work for Shelby. After being made to wait an entire day in the shop foreman's office, Larry left frustrated, never given the chance to interview. Months later, a friend of his named Jim Law was put in charge of Shelby's operations, and Larry's fortunes changed. My name is Jim Law, who now works for Toyota in their emissions lab. And he was their for, uh, shop foreman. And he came in, and when I went in there, he, I went right into his office, and he says, you know, I've been doing your work for another person, uh, through another person, and I'd like to go directly with you. And he says, okay, to make a long story short. So he called back to his head department and says, uh, bring up a pair of heads. And he did. And uh, I got a whole long list of instructions, of which I didn't agree with. So and he says, here's a set of heads. See, let me see what you can do. And I says, okay. So I took them home and I brought them back on a, a, a Took me about a week to go through them to figure out how to make them, to, to learn how to do the work the way they wanted it. And I just didn't agree with it, so I did it my way. 
and they said, uh, uh, so I took them back to them and they says, this is not exactly what you wanted, but this is what I think you should have. But I will take them back and rework them the way you want them. And uh, they said, no, I got to have them right away. Okay. So I left them. And this was on a Monday. On a Wednesday, I got a call saying, what in the hell, excuse my language, did you guys do to these heads? And what do you mean? I told you if you didn't like them, I would rework them. And he says, oh, no, no, no. Uh, we got 15 more horsepower out of the engine than we've ever had before. Can you make more of them? And I said, well, yeah. And so that was in May of 1965. In May of 1965, when Larry contracted with Shelby, he was building heads for the 289 motor, the same motor that had already seen much success on the tracks of Europe and the United States in the AC Cobra. Although Larry had been doing work prior with another contractor, and most likely some of that work contributed to the Cobra's success, Larry now had his opportunity to directly impact the future of Shelby Racing. These are the heads that uh, we got back today from Larry O'Free at Valley Head Service. These are the heads that are going on 5R002. Uh, we took a, a bare set of 60, late 64 hypo heads and sent them to him to do everything that he did to the original heads for the car. Uh, first thing that he did was we did a, a porting and polish job on, on both the intake and exhaust ports. Uh, the intake ports flow 197 CFM, the exhaust ports, ports flow 170 CFM. Uh, he port matched them all so they all flow exactly the same. Uh, he put uh, stainless steel valves in it and set all the springs up for the cam that we're going to use. He works very closely with Engel cams and have they've developed a, a special cam for high performance 289s over the years and he set these heads up to flow at the specs of that cam. Uh, we did we did a intake port job. He uh, ported the heads all the way down into the combustion. I mean, the valve pocket. He installed uh, 194 valves on the intakes and 160 on the exhaust. He uh, polished all the combustion chambers and uh, reworked the combustion chambers so we get better flame travel. Uh, he filled in the water passage uh, holes on the uh, head surface to uh, stop the uh, uh, steam pockets from forming in the head um, and then he ported the exhaust here and port matched all the exhaust and poured them all down into the valve pocket and uh, and then he put uh, retainers and springs on the heads cut to cut the heads for larger springs and we pretty much had him do everything just like that they would have done in 1965. And then he stamped the heads with Valley Head Service, Canoga Park, California, just like they would have originally. Every Monday was pickup and delivery day. I would, they would give me four sets of heads. I'd start on Tuesday and get them done by Friday and deliver them on Monday. And in, in the meantime, I, was, I had free run of the shop, so to speak. And at that time, I was only interested in the engine shop, so I didn't get around and see the cars or production lines or anything like that. But we started out at Princeton Street, uh, and then uh, later on, we went to the uh, uh, Imperial plant, which was a uh, aircraft hangar. And that's when they started making a production line. So all we did was supporting, and they had their own valve department. Uh, that they did all in-house and the finished work they did all in-house. And then as time went on we started doing more and more work for Shelby like Some of the other research and development that Larry did for Carroll Shelby was on intake manifolds. Larry had extensive knowledge of induction systems and he used that knowledge to develop intake systems for Carroll Shelby's race cars. We chose not to use Larry on this car because this car came with a Cobra race engine installed and that was done before Larry started doing the intake manifolds for Carroll Shelby in 1966. Started doing manifolds and they, they wanted us to match the manifolds to the heads because the manifolds were very good. But, but What year did you start doing the manifolds? Uh, I would say it was in the 289 so I would say probably 1966 or 67 they started doing the manifolds. 
Mm -hmm. you were doing, were you doing all the manifolds for, for Shelby Racing at that point? As far as I know. As far as you know. Well, I was doing all their work after right. July. Okay. So after July of 1965, I was doing all of their work. So I would have been, I was doing both the Webers and the single four barrels. The ones for the Cobras. Now this is only for the race versions. And then, like I said earlier, the all the stuff that went to Le Mans, that when Ford run everything there, was all the stuff that I had done. Around 68, started moving faster and faster, and, and, and in 1970 we were really going full bore at that point. I mean, we were really producing some stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, you said you were doing four heads a week to begin with. Yes. Four sets of heads a week. Some of them went in boxes, some of them went on engines, and some of them they sold over the counter. Although Larry did work for Shelby on a variety of projects, his work on the engine heads is the most notable. One of the tools that made him so successful in this area was the airflow bench he built himself. It's in 1968, and that kind of gave us a leg up on what was happening in the real world, so to speak. You, as you can see, these are several prototype heads. That's a, that was the Shelby prototype head when he was doing work with Chrysler. Airflow benches are commonplace today. However, in the 1960s, their use was more innovative. Larry was able to utilize his knowledge in vacuum and pressures to create a tool that gave him and Shelby a competitive advantage. This is the original one that we built two of them for. Uh, we built one for us and one for Shelby. And... Uh, we used it up until about seven or eight years ago, and then we bought the new one here. And this is all the computerized version of it. Larry speaks fondly at Carroll Shelby when you mention his name. He credits the tall Texan for much of his success. But there were other influences by big-name racers who also had a major impact on Larry's career. And, uh, mine, in fact, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be in business today. He was a guy by the name of Mickey Thompson. And somehow or another, Mickey Thompson was able to get a hold of me. I did some work for him uh, on the Ford uh, funny cars that he was uh, building. He had two of them. One of them was driven by Danny on Gaius. The other one was driven in the early times by Pat Foster and then later on became Bobby Pickett, uh, who would happen to be our driver. When I needed something, Mickey was there. I cannot say enough good things about Mickey Thompson. Mickey Thompson was a guy, if he liked you, he'd give you the world. If he didn't like it, you better leave town. <laughs> or start digging. <laughs> but uh, again, I cannot say enough good things about Mickey. And then, of course, he did the Pontiac work uh, for uh, a guy by the name of Al Bartz, who uh, was... Uh, getting the engines... Uh, Al Bartz was building the engines for TG Racing which was Jerry Titus yeah. and, and Terry Gotzel. Yeah. Uh, now that's the man I really miss. Jerry Titus. T Jerry Titus. Jerry Titus' shop was right next door to us. Really? Yes, and uh, that guy was probably the biggest gentleman in the world. Really? I mean, he'd give you the shirt off his back if it was zero outside. Jerry Titus died days after his 1970 Firebird hit a bridging embankment at a race in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. The car was reported to have been crushed after an inconclusive test was performed to determine the cause of the crash. The only part of the 1970 Firebird left was the trunk lid, a piece of racing memorabilia that now hangs in Valley Head Service as a tribute to Larry O'Fria's fallen friend. Going out all in the process of rebuilding it now and refinishing all this area. It was all broken out and cracked and stuck and everything. So, For almost 60 years, Larry O'Fria has been doing what he loves. His contributions to auto racing are countless, but you would never know it by meeting the man. He is kind and humble, still doing what he does best building motors and making race cars go fast.